My time is counted, so I will dig right in. Um, today I will present to you the Open Food Network, uh, on which I'm working on as a PhD and a fellow at the ICDE. So, sorry. Okay, what is the Open Food Network? Um, incorporated as a nonprofit, it's an international network that uh, develops and distributes uh, a digital platform that's based on open source software and that enables developing, sorry, okay, and managing a, and organizing local food hubs or direct to consumer um, uh, sales of local products. Uh, so this self-called global digital uh, food commons was created in uh, 2012 in Australia by two uh, women, one of which was a former civil servant uh, working on climate change and the other an anthropologist working on local farmers' relation to change. Uh, so they both wanted to create an, an accessible at and sustainable alternative to uh, the very centralized uh, production and distribution food systems in Australia. And to do so, they created a local food hub and they quickly realized that their work would be made much easier with the use of a digital tool and finding none that responded to their uh, needs nor values, especially that of decentralization. Uh, they decided to develop the open food network. Um, so the Open Food Network has now been around for uh, more than 10 years and um, it's now present in about 25 countries in the world or so-called local branches, uh, half of which uh, have been developed during the COVID pandemic. Um, as you can see, one is currently developing in India and to be fully honest, I don't exactly know uh, where the project's at at the moment, apart from the fact that in 2016, uh, two people contributed to buying a domain for the Open Food Network in India. Um, all right, so other than that, uh, just to give you a brief idea of, of how work is organized uh, at the Open Food Network, you basically have a global community that's composed of 14 staff members, uh, all of which are paid to uh, develop and promote the platform. Then uh, at the country level, you have teams that work on local developments of the platform and interact with the global community. And then you have users who are uh, basically small-scale farmers, producers, or any kind of entity that uh, organizes local food hubs. And just to give you numbers, as of 2020, um, the platform had, at the global level, it had enabled a total of 170,000 or, orders, which sum up to a total of 3.5 million euros worth of transaction. And as the co-founder of the French platform estimated, these numbers were uh, supposed to at least double every year since then. And sorry, this is what we've observed with the French platform, which I will present to you now. So this one was created in 2016 initially as a non-profit, but which turned into a Société Coopérative d'Intérêt Collectif at the beginning of 2020, which is uh, basically a, leg a legal status that's equivalent to multi-stakeholder uh, co-op. Um, so again, uh, just to give you numbers apart from those that are present on the slides, um, the, the number of uh, basically, the, the, as of 2022, uh, the uh, number of transactions that have been made on the French platform sum up to 4.3 million euros. And uh, the platform today um, relies on the work of, on the paid labor of five uh, part-time independent workers, as well as on voluntary contributions. Um, all right, and another thing that you can see on the screen is the logo of uh, Les Licornes, which is a network of French cooperatives in various sectors, of which Coop Circuit is part of, and that aim to transform the economy through the spread of digital principles. And as you can see, I've put up in red quite a lot of excerpts from the interviews I've carried out with uh, the Open Food Network users and workers, and I'm just going to develop one point, which is one that relates to the main challenge that Coop Circuit is facing right now it's finding uh, the right economic model for it to be viable so now the funding of this platform is based on uh, the sales of the social shares of the platform as well as a commission on sales and basically although the platform remains competitive like cheaper than its competitors in the sector it doesn't uh, raise enough revenue at the moment to um, 
pay for the platform and its workers at the global community as well, to say it simply. Um, all right, and now I'm quickly going to give you an overview of the US platform that I'm also working on. And as you can see, uh, the user interface is the same. One, one difference is that the US platform is managed as a nonprofit, but it also shares uh, cooperative principles uh, among the, the global community. Um, okay, so I've also put up some numbers regarding the number of orders and of producers uh, that um, interact in the, on, on this platform. And in terms of labor, uh, the US platform relies on uh, uh, the work of four active contributors, one of which is paid for by the global community. Um, and yes, I, all right. Um, one thing that I have noticed is that uh, basically a lot of producers and shops that you see registered on the map here um, are actually not using the platform. So with those that I've managed to reach, they gave several reasons for that. But one of my hypotheses is basically that the platform is more active in places where you had pre-existing uh, solid and active uh, networks of farmers or local food hubs. So as the platform is being used more as a, uh, like a technological complement to their um, activity. And just to very quickly finish, I want to present two types of projects that I find interesting and that the OFN supports because they relate to scaling. One of them is uh, data interoperability. So basically the English speaking and French speaking branches of the, uh, of the network um, together develop a common language or standard to uh, make the transfer of data from one platform to another more easy. And then another other types of projects are those that attempt to make uh, local food hubs more socially inclusive. So with this, well, here you see that uh, I presented the basically the pricing model of the US platform is based on membership, but, but you have a little disclaimer at the top that says that uh, basically historically marginalized communities can have access to the platform for free in exchange of uh, non-monetary non contributions, such as uh, promotion of the platform and social media, for instance. And just to finish up, also uh, what you see at the bottom here is an online catalog, again, of the US platform. And you see that you can select products based on different criteria, such as uh, being able to, to pay for them with uh, social benefits from the uh, government food support program. And here, um, I see some similarities with uh, the ADAR that you have in India and access to social benefits through social identity. And all that I've presented has uh, some advantages and some limits, and I'll be happy to discuss all of them later on. Thank you. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Ela. I'm based in Berlin. Yeah, based in Berlin. Now I'm here. And um, I will talk a little bit about Platform Corps Germany and what we are doing. This is us, uh, the three founders and board members of Platform Corps Germany. Andreas, our co-founder, is with me. He's in the audience. And Claudia has to stay back in Hamburg, unfortunately. So uh, our cooperative was founded in 2020. And our goal is to help other cooperatives to um, yeah, come into life and to uh, thrive. This is, this is our basic goal. This is uh, what we are doing. And I will talk about what we're actually doing in a second. So we do a lot of pre-seed work, consultancy, but also lobbying for cooperatives. And um, we try to explore new cooperative paradigms, um, not only in Berlin, but also beyond. Rebuild Co-op is our motto, and that has to do with a long-standing German legacy of cooperatives. Um, we have a lot of cooperative banks and supermarkets, etc., but um, many of them do not really operate cooperatively. Uh, and on the other hand, we have a, uh, especially in Berlin, there is a, an amazing scene of cooperatives that are newly founded. A lot of them platform co-ops, but also yeah, cooperative supermarkets, etc. And they really want to reinvent uh, the cooperative economy in many different ways. And over the past years, we have collected a couple of really important action items that we 
subsumize under a rebuilt co-op. And here you can see a couple of, of these action items. And this is, is really developing protocols for social coordination at scale. So how can we become better in activating a large membership globally? Um, we are exploring new forms of decentralized governance. How, how can we actually steer these projects together, not only locally, but also in connection to a global membership? What else do we have? Uh, legal frameworks. I have, I'm really interested in learning from you how the legal framework in your countries work. In Germany, we have a very rigid legal framework which on the one hand is fantastic because it really helps and it sustains cooperatives and protects them. But on the other hand, it also sometimes is difficult because it also keeps them from evolving and developing further. So there's still a lot of work to do. Intercooperation, we've seen it in the very first presentation, cooperatives really should cooperate uh, with, with other co-ops because that in our understanding is, is the, really the goal. And there's still a lot of work to do. Um, we are looking into new forms of member funding, not just member credit, um, but also other ways of uh, funding money online collectively via new tools. So these are the main things um, content-wise we do. How are we funded? Well, we are a group of people we have founded without any funds, first of all. We are... On a regular basis, uh, we manage to get project funds. Right now, we are funded by Social Economy Berlin, which is an in initiative of the Senate of Economy and also the German Ministry of Economy, where that allows us to really do pre-seed consultancy work with cooperative founders, but also helping to transform existing organizations into cooperatives. So this is what we're currently doing and how we are financed. And um, yeah, that's just the overview. Um, so uh, cooperative business modeling, developing financial strategies, and um, ex oh, excusing. And we co-found cooperatives. I think this is another really important aspect. For us, it's not enough to simply consult cooperatives, but we really want to be included and want to immerse ourselves into the actual work of co-founding these organizations because that's where actually the, a lot of the work lies. And this is where people are very often needed to really get our, getting our hands dirty in the actual work of, of building these organizations. We're doing a lot of lobbying work, mainly with Geno Digital. Uh, and this is all about making cooperatives in Germany more digital we engage in community building and education. And we've heard before how important that is because there's still so much work to do in educating people around cooperatives. Um, despite the fact that many Germans live in an environment which was shaped by cooperatives, but many of them are simply not aware of it any longer. Our challenges, uh, I would say our biggest challenge is to, um, yeah, to manage to get regular funds. This is uh, something that, yeah, is I, I would say you can all relate to because I guess you are in a similar situation. And another big challenge I find is still um, to having to explain the topic over and over again. <laughs> also, we did this morning. <laughs> we should assume that many of us know about those principles, but still. Again and again, we have to come back to explaining why this is a good idea, why it's worthwhile, why, why we, we are building capacity here. So I would say these are, these are challenges. And if you want to know what keeps us going, um, people like you keep us going, the organizations, the platform we work with keep us going because it allows us to have access to an amazing group of people it allows us to really build infrastructures that we are convinced will help not only us, but also everyone else um, in the long run. And this is where our energy comes from, and this is what sustains ourselves. And that's me, and I'm looking forward to talking to you in the next days. Thank you. Uh, I am Jenny. I come from this nonprofit organization in Delhi called Digital Empowerment Foundation. Uh, Digital Empowerment Foundation was founded by Osama Mansur. Uh, 
with a mission to end information poverty. Osama could not be here today, so I'll be speaking about the initiative. Um, uh, one thing, I mean, unlike a lot of people here, I was not really familiar with the idea of platform cooperativism. And then, you know, when we were asked to speak, I thought like a good fit uh, out of many digital initiative DF is doing is Mera app. Uh, so Mera app is actually, you know, an app designed to sort of collect all the government schemes and entitlements in one place and then organize it in terms of, you know, what is your gender, what is your age, uh, whether you are a person with di uh, disability, and then, uh, you know, make it easier to uh, deliver these schemes to the people. Uh, you know, just to give a context of how it emerged, DEF was actually working on a project of entitlement delivery for three, four years, and, you know, when they were doing it, they realized that it is not, you know, like depending on, you know, what is, you know, like different states, their budget, which government is in power, all of these schemes keep changing, all of the eligibility criteria of these schemes changing. So, you know, just to give you an example, imagine you're a migrant worker in Delhi and then you want to, you know, you have this scheme called Building and Other Construction Workers Act and you can actually, you know, uh, get a lot of schemes under that. So, you know, you know, you fell sick and then like three, four days you didn't get, uh, you know, paid. And the act actually has a provision to pay you for these three, four days you are taking uh, off. But imagine a migrant worker in Delhi reaching and then trying to find, like, you know, that person is never going to know about this app, first of all. Even if they know about this scheme, they can't access a computer center. Uh, because if you just want to access the scheme, then you'll have to go through an entire set of paperwork to prove that you are a worker. So in Delhi, to prove that you are a construction worker, maybe you can prove that you worked, uh, you know, a union can certify you. But if you go to a different state like Uttar Pradesh, then you'll have to show a master role and then say that, listen, I have worked for uh, 90 days, which is again not possible for a migrant worker because a migrant worker works in different workplaces. So it's just one example, you know, just to show the context in which uh, the app emerged. Uh, so, the yeah, one challenge that we also try to address is the issue of sustainability. That even if you, you know, have a funded project that, you know, the project is going to end. So who is going to take up uh, the service delivery, information as a service del delivery? So, Sushnapreneurs are the, you know, a network of social entrepreneurs associated with DEF. Uh, so, they basically use Mera app, to Mera app to deliver services to rural households and charge a fee for it. And they keep 100% of this charge to themselves. So, we, ha we are active in 24 states in India in 2,000 locations. So, uh, you know, we provide, uh, you know, different entitlements to people. And Sushnapreneurs not only just deliver these, uh, you know, services or information to people, we also have a Telegram-based chat board on uh, digital literacy. So along with delivering the services, the chat board also, uh, you know, which is a multilingual app, where, you know, how to use internet, how to use a computer is also simplified. And uh, all of this comes with, a, you know, a set of different services the Sushna Pranas are providing. Uh, another aspect of it is that the Sushna Pranas are not only connected with, like, they are not bound to only work for DEF. Mostly these people are also, you know, people who are running a small shop uh, uh, in a village. You know, you have a beauty parlor and then on the side of it you want to, you know, uh, sell these services. The benefit of it is that you have last mile access to entitlement uh, and services. Um, yeah, so I mean, these are some of the questions which I had in mind when, you know, you know, that when I actually thought about the concept of platform cooperativism and this, you know, the service delivered here is actually information and, you know, it emerged out of a social need rather than a, you know, a, a business idea. And 
you know it's also not like challenging any large scale commercial platform like you know for example a, a you know drivers app challenging uber uh, and it's mostly challenging the middlemen and uh, the fraud on entitlement delivery uh some of the challenges which uh, you know which we deal with is one the app needs constant maintenance and we are a non profit and you know the we also had to raise funds for the main the maintenance of the app the app also has a lot of bugs so some of the functions do not work at times so th these are some of the things which that you know that has been pointed out uh, pointed out to me by the team who is operating it uh that's it uh you know late we can discuss individually if you have any questions thank you so maybe just to uh like uh, jack jump in for one second which is basically what you see here is uh, i think that as you saw with platform corps germany there are several incubators or accelerators like that around the world so from australia to germany uh to the united states and uh, other countries where they are in the making so that's an important part of this puzzle right uh, and so is uh, research right but there's clearly a business side to it right and there's a research component to it so that's sort of like what makes that ecosystem uh thrive and handing it over to felix who's a cooperative serial entrepreneur okay yeah i'm also very happy to be here wonderful and nice to meet you all so i'm going to actually use these 7 minutes to talk about two projects um first a cooperative that we founded a platform co-op that we founded in 2012 fairmondo it's an online marketplace owned by its users and employees and yeah i'm going to be quick with that one um so it's a website an online platform um so i just want to actually it became four lessons not three um mentioned four lessons from that experience um i'm not working for fimondo anymore so i'm just giving some insights that i personally have for anyone who wants to set up an online marketplace <clears throat> so for me it was really an insight that the offer is the crucial part like that's what you are showing to potential customers um they often say it's a chicken chicken egg problem but i feel it's not that it's actually really focus on the offer first um then a marketplace in my view is a lot about curation and having making it easy for for anyone visiting the site to to find what what they are interested in but also to get access to quality and to to in the jungle of potential products to find the ones that are actually well of high quality of um maybe sustainable background and so on so this kind of selection the filtering is very important the yeah and um i think this is in general for any type of uh, business very important to involve your customers um involve ideally your members in um how you design your product and um well there um there are many tools for this um um what that you can use but i think the the most important is to really reach out to to members early to your customers early and involve them um i think this is one thing that we really learned um yeah and um if you create a marketplace and you looking for a niche um i think it's it's also important to look for something where you really have regular needs so that you can create quickly a sustainable business model based on this and i want to say um please reach out you can reach me for example at felix@platform21.net if you're interested in marketplaces i'm happy to talk about this but now i'm going to talk about another project um that i'm focusing on now which is cozy ai it's about artificial intelligence and how we can use it to advance co-ops but also how we can create a framework for owning artificial intelligence tools um probably all of you know that um there's a an accelerating um um spread of ai around the world in in business and in, in in our economies and um in 
it's it's hard to to grasp actually what's happening there right now. But if you just look at the numbers of market size, um, you see that, and these are projections. You see that up to twenty three, they've been almost a doubling every year, and uh, they are projecting that this is going to move on. Um, but it's um, it's much more than that. It's going to be um, influencing technologies, and that's why all the big tech companies are investing in um, in AI and in large scales. And they are, and this is also what I want to show with this slide. Um, there are startups um, that have quite ambitious um, social or, yeah, you could say safety and perspectives like OpenAI, Anthropic, um, Inflection AI. They all have a focus on building safe AGI. <laughs> um, and then they are all relying on funding and big investments and also provi provision of, um, of CPUs, of, of compute power, by, well, the, the large ones that we already know. And um, this is the current situation. So now we are um, creating a coalition to, um, to provide an alternative to this and to see how uh, we can use this emerging technology that's um, getting that's accelerating right now and that's going to be more and more relevant um, in the next month and for sure years. Um, <clears throat> how, we, how can we among the platform co-ops that are already there and the tech companies that are already having a focus on cooperative mindsets and collective perspectives, um, how we, can we build a coalition to really use this tool, and this new tool that's emerging there, um, and start early adapting it, relatively early. <laughs> um, so for that, we want to create a global cooperative um, among tech co-ops and, and other people who are also as individuals interested in joining this. And we are um, aiming at offering so-called cooperative AI models. Um, so there are already quite a few advanced open source large language models out there that we can use and that we can fine tune and adapt. Um, I'm going to talk about this more in the afternoon. But um, the whole idea is that we already have among us co-ops a lot of resources that are valuable to building um, specific specialized AI that is helpful for cooperatives. And this is in particular in all the data that we have access to and that are unique to co-ops. Um, so we, we are aiming at creating a framework for this. And yeah, that's, uh, that's so far. Um, I'm just describing the, 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 the plan that we have now. I'm going to talk a little more in the afternoon. And... Um, also, if you're interested in this, please reach out to Felix at CozyAI.net. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hello. I want to do a thought experiment with you first before I talk about this. It's not really a thought experiment because it's kind of going to happen and it's happening already. But I want you all to think about however many years into the future that number is, to when you have stopped working, you're getting older, you're frailer, you may have any number of things wrong with you, and you are approaching your death. Who is around you? Who is supporting you? Who is available to you at that time? at that most precious and difficult and intimate time of your life? And what is society doing now? Who is society making available to people now who are experiencing that, both within and without this room? I'm sure that there are many mothers, fathers, daughters, sons, friends. Everybody knows someone. The problem that we have in the United Kingdom and globally is that nobody really cares enough to pay enough attention to fund that work properly and to really think about what it means to be chronically ill, to be disabled, 
to be growing old and what a good death actually looks like. Currently, in my country and in many others, you're very likely to get maybe a half hour visit from a different person every single day who'll be in and out, who'll be on horrible wages, who will likely be a woman, likely be a member of an ethnic minority of whichever country, and who is almost definitely having a terrible time themselves and is also being exploited in various different ways. So how on earth can we care for the people who are growing old? How on earth can we build a society that's gonna care for ourselves? If we're not thinking about this from a systemic perspective, from a cooperative perspective, and from a rights and a social justice perspective. Is everyone there? <laughs> so, oh my goodness, I've died. that wasn't the first slide. Yeah, no, that's not the first slide. No one can read that. Okay, ah, that was. So, you probably can't read that either. Equal care is a co-op, we're a platform co-op, and we were set up um, to look at the way that power is distributed very poorly in the social care system and the health system, actually. Um, so it's created to fund bureaucracies, it's created to support regulation, it's, it's not about the people that are at the center of that process. It's not about the person who is receiving the care, and it's not about the person who is giving the care and support. So let's build an organization, let's build a society where that, it does start to be about that. We're one of the small ones, <laughs> still. Um, but one of the key things that we are seeing from the way that we work is a really, really high retention rate, so 98%, um, on average, and this is real data <laughs> from the last couple of years, you will see around three people in your support. So that is three people who get to know you, who you get to know, you know your, you, you know, you know your compromises, you know your challenges, you work through stuff together. Um, and we do that uh, through building a model that looks like this. There's not a, there's not a smartphone in sight. <laughs> so up on the right, there's Molly, Dora is the dog, and Iris. Um, Molly supports Iris with Dora as well. Um, and Molly is a member of Iris's team. So... Iris, who's getting support, she chooses her team members, she builds her team, she also has other members of her team in there, so family members, um, people who are also supporting her from other organizations as well are all members of her team. Over here is Care in Common, so there's community, and below that's a, an image of our AGM. Um, and this is the structure that we've been working on building over the past four years. It's, to, it's a labor of love. My <laughs> Um, so a team is led and owned by the person getting support. Teams are then supported by local circles. And this is where this part participation in management, the mention of the Mondragon principles really, really comes through. Um, so every member of a team, regardless of whether you are receiving support or giving support or a family member paid unpaid, has a role and has a responsibility. We call these hats. And then the local circles are responsible for supporting those teams. Um, and the circles are predominantly made up of workers, but in, in our area in Yorkshire, but in London, it's also members from the community, volunteers, other organizations that make up the circle. So a circle can be anything. We're also talking to a group of um, uh, an African diaspora collective organizing movement for them to start up a circle to solve the problems that they're facing in their community with the kind of injustices that black workers face in the care sector in London. Teams, there's the hats. So we all have different responsibilities that we distribute amongst members of the co-op. In a team, your responsibility might be around keeping the support profile up to date, which is usually kind of a province of management. It might be around organizing the rotor, which is also usually province of management. It might be keeping the medicines up to date. Again, province of management, bringing it into the people who actually are doing the work, who know um, 
uh, who, who know and can make the right decisions and work in collaboration with the person who's receiving support. It's like, it's not rocket science. It's, it's really kind of basic. Um, and then we use a process called sociocracy. I don't know how many of the people in the room have heard it, but to distribute those hats and to decide by consent who does what. Um, examples of different members of the teams. Oh, yes. And then there is a platform, because we are a platform co-op after all. Um, but the real focus of the platform is on making things as simple as possible and on keeping the interface as simple as possible as well. So kind of instead of moving into more and more functionality, it's more about moving into more and more sort of different channels. So being able to communicate by SMS so, and um, even through the post uh, so that the interaction that you're having with this digital thing um, can be on any, on any layer. And it could be on a conversation with the person who's supporting you um, that then gets kind of reflected in the platform, uh, whether that's a kind of day-to-day -day change um, or, or any wholesale changes you might want to make in your team. Um, this is a really, really hard thing to do. <laughs> So it's simple because you focus on relationships and every single member of this room, if you're even starting to think about co-ops, you need to be thinking about relationships and how they work and how they don't work um, and what kind of dynamics can set up really flourishing, proud relationships where, in our case, the people giving the support and receiving support remain in control of that work or whether the organizations that we're building, kind of, I guess, collectively as a society, are demeaning and destroying those sorts of relationships. Um, and I think that platform co-ops as a whole <laughs> has a lot to say about changing the ground on which we walk. So the relationships and the communications that we have with members of society, regardless, instead of the, the management talking to the worker and the, work, the parent-child relationship or the consumer, um, the consumer provider relationship. We have the member owner. We have, we have a much, much more healthy way of looking at how to live and how to die. And I think that this is one of the great promises of this conference here that I really hope we can build on over the next few days because care at base is the absolute core. Every single person in this room is going to have to face it or has already faced it or is facing it. It's a problem that is, that is universal. So let's accept the challenge. I think that's all I have to say. <laughs> And then one of the small things uh, that Emma didn't mention, uh, at least from some of the uh, member owners in the cooperative that I spoke to, they reported how their income had also doubled and how uh, the little things in life. Right? Uh, and how, for example, this one worker mentioned that now he could afford a, to go to a fitness center and how that contributed to his overall well-being enormously, right? Because he wasn't so stressed out anymore right, by this job. Okay, so, and we are uh, topping it off, uh, not with a tea break, uh, but with uh, Akanat. And uh, I'm not quite sure where the slides are. Yeah, apparently, can you wing this without the slides, Akanat? Uh, this may be necessary. Uh, thank you. Right, um, yes, thank you, Trevor, and um, good morning, everyone. My name is Akanat. I'm working as a researcher at the Institute of Asian Studies at Chulalongkorn University, Bangkok. Um, recently, I um, initiate a platform called Tam Sang, Tam Song, which literally means um, you order and we um, deliver. Um, during the, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, I um, do I conduct a research on the working conditions of the platform workers and um, because of that research, we learned a lot about the relationships among stakeholders and um, we found that, well, it's become, you know, terrible because um, all stakeholders involved in the ecosystem, they got lost. And, you know, because of the COVID pandemic, our government came out with the uh, measurements that, you know, 
not allow everyone to eat at the restaurant. You are allowed to buy and eat at home. I think you know, same with other countries. And uh, because of that, then buying foods from platforms become necessaries, right? And their business was growing up like three folds. And um, beside that, the platform company came with an idea that well. Well, this is an opportunity. So they try to get more from the restaurant. They already get like 30%, percent, one third. But at that point, they said, "Well, we need more. We need 35%. percent." And I think, well, that's that's enough. That's that's done. So I um, talk with a group of motorcycle taxi in Bangkok, which we have a close relationship. We work for years together. And um, they stuck with uh, platforms because when platform came, um, they were challenged because they lost their you know job security, right? And um, they cannot join the platform basically because um, what the platform offers, the algorithm was actually illegal. They were informal before, but they were legalized by authorities. And once they legalized, then there are regulations that they have to follow and to join. The platform, they will have to violate that, so they were not happy to join the platforms, right? But um, they're stuck. Goes, they have no um, platforms by themselves. They want to have platform, but they don't. They don't know how how to start. So um, from that background, we started. We managed to um, work together. I have a groups of um, students and um, colleagues. We start our own platform at. Uh, One location in Bangkok, and well, when we first think of the concept that we are going to use for this um, platform, I realized that you know, past few years I work, uh, conduct a research with Dr. Green Sak here. I have to give him a credit because uh, we conduct a research on the platform workers, and um, then we kind of discuss if there are any alternative. And he mentioned the term solidarity economy. That was the first time that we, um, you know, have I can imagine things that outside of the economic system that we live in, right? So when we started this project, we um, try to adopt this concept, solidarity economy. Um, which means that we um, care more about stakeholders, not shareholders. We, um, you know, care more about benefits, not only profits. And we uh, try to collaborate, not compromise. We let them, you know, stakeholders fight against each others, and then we um, make them work together. So at the beginning, we are very s u c k e r because we have a very limited um, fundings. We got a very small funding from um, the Thai Health Foundation Fund, like three thousand US dollars. That's not enough to build any kind of platform, right? But we uh, managed to use several kinds of digital tools that we have, and we um, managed to, you know, the process we call proof of concept, right? With um, that, in the very beginning, um, after we spend some times, like three months, then. Um, There is a sign of of success, and then the funders very happy that you know with a very minimum um, budget we can you know create some kind of toolings that prove that you know communities can work together. Not only motorcycle taxi driver, but restaurant owners and uh, people that live in the community can work together and own a platform by themselves. So they give us more money. My university is kind enough to give us more money and. Now, uh, with that, you know, fundings, we um, started to have our own real application. You know that we can um, work on um, iOS and Android, and also those who are not familiar with smartphones, we um, manage it to also use on the um, social media. s You know, in Thailand, we have lines, kind of um, messaging. Um, platforms, but um, lately, Line would like to, you know, create their as a super app, so they allow developer to work on on their platforms, and so our platforms can um, serve those who use iPhone, those who use Android, and those who, you know, have no 
enough, not enough knowledge or digital literacy to use those smartphones, right? We uh, offer them uh, a, another method to, to use. Since we claim that this is a, a platform for opportunities, so we make sure that everyone would like to join are able to, to join. And right now, we run like, you know, um, all over Thailand, more than um, 10. And I would have to admit that it fails more than success, but there are some areas that, you know, very success, for example, in southernmost provinces of, of Thailand. And um, because of that success, then it's motivate us to, to work more. And um, well, now we have a several projects out of that. We also use the data that we um, have on our original platform to create another platform. For example, um, the so-called Thai Economaps, which actually is very inspired. And, and I got the idea from, you know, the needs map that I, I saw from um, the website. And I think that, well, we should have this kind of um, things that not only what people need and what people would like to offer us, but for other activities like, you know, people that would like to have jobs, those people who find people that working for them. So we create this kind of, of um, um, platforms out of, out of that. So just to show you an example of how we uh, start very small and within a you know, few years, um, we create impacts. And now platform co-ops become things that we started to talk. We recently have um, Trevor give a talk in Bangkok. And it seems like from now on, um, we have a lot of things to do. So that's, that's from me. Thank you. So we started with this uh, big picture from the Kerala government, right, that sort of talked about their effort. We talked uh, with this very high level sort of introduct introduction by um, Anita Gora Murthy. And uh, then we had this uh, dialogical beginning where we outlined the principles, right, and the values of cooperatives and tried to then apply this to cooperatives. I showed you a little bit about the impact in passing. So uh, we touched a lot of people with this work, some 290,000 people through these conferences alone. And uh, a lot of uh, projects started out of our courses and so on. And then you saw uh, the, the, the support system, right, like with Elacago, uh, with um, Platform Corps Germany, for example, there's a similar group in the UK, um, out of uh, Cooperatives UK, that's an incubator for Platform Corps specifically, there's Start.coop in the United States, there's Incubator.coop in Australia, so that's a really important part of it. And then you got a bit of a flavor, right, of these projects with, uh, like, in these important sectors like, you know, uh, uh, care, for example, right, which I think is also a lot of applicability in Kerala, right, but also everywhere else around the world. But here in particular, because there is such strong support for cooperatives. And so there could, this could really uh, bring a model that uh, could be really interesting, of course. So is everybody else's, right? An intervention in agriculture, like the Open Food Network, uh, and also in delivery with uh, Akanat's project, right? Okay, so we have a few more minutes, right? You said, uh, saying, so actually I might, believe it or not, there might be room for a question or two. Uh, so who wants to be brave? Is there a culture in Kerala where people ask questions? Yeah, hello, my name is Anurag. I'm from National Cooperative Union of India. So my question is, all the platform cooperatives that you talk about or we have seen here, the, uh, the common problem that every platform cooperative face is the lack of funds. Funds to build the infrastructure, uh, funds to run that application, that software. So where will the funds come from? Because the members that we are catering with are belong to the uh, people from poor social and economic background. So where will the funds come from? Well, we actually started to address this uh, with the Drivers Cooperative, right? Uh, and I think uh, one of source of funding that you left out was the National Cooperative Bank, right? Uh, that is also contributed. Uh, and then, you know, philanthropy, uh, member participation, uh, crowdfunding, are all options uh, and things that we've seen, right? And of course, maybe maybe we hand this over to uh, uh, to Ken. Maybe with the microphone there. Right? I think one of the things that we overlook in cooperatives, yes, we come from marginal groups. 
But I find that members are very interested in contributing to their co-ops. It's a sense of ownership. And so we found that drivers, many times when we told them that, look, we are going to start a new funding, many of them were anxious. So we take a 15%, but some were saying, look, you can take 20 and let us contribute every 5% for each trip. So I think don't overlook the contributions of membership to fund their own organizations. Thanks. Hello, uh, this is Uttar Erhard from Needscop. Uh, I'm here with uh, Mehmet Saraja. So I had a question for Emma. Uh, I was really curious about your income model because like in Turkey, for example, people live on very, very small amount of pensions. So were they contributing um, to the model? I was curious about that. Do they give any money uh, to, to just uh, get these services? Um. Every funding system is different. Uh, they all have in common that they're underfunded <laughs> for care. Um, in the UK, there is a cap. So some people have to pay for their own care, but they are means tested. So if they have more than 23,000 pounds in savings um, in the bank, then they have to pay for all of their own care and support. So it's a real mix of sometimes the NHS pays, sometimes the council pays, sometimes the person pays. What we're looking at, because um, care prices have gone like that with um, the, uh, the inflation over the past couple of years, is developing, and this is actually in response also to, you, to your question earlier as well around funding, um, a, a form of transferable investment that is essentially almost like, a, like with Kickstarter, like you buy the product in advance, um, and but because we're a co-op, you can, you can use it as an investment. So for us, it goes on the equity sh side of the balance sheet. And you would buy care at a specific price, and then you kind of, you use it as an inflation hedge. So you can then um, draw down on that once the co-op is up and running. So particularly as a way of, of raising that capital. Um, but yeah, and, and then be able to sell it on to people who are still in a position where they have to fund their own care. Um, cause yeah, it's really expensive. Um, one of the benefits of, of working as a team and being very agnostic about the membership is that anybody who is giving care and support to that person, regardless of what the relationship is, and as long as that person consents, is then a member of their team. So it brings in a lot of kind of community volunteer, in, informal labor, family support, and starts to recognize some of that work. My name is Esther Gechero. I'm from the Cooperative University of Kenya. And my question is uh, on, I have forgotten the name, the one, uh, just, yes, 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 Ken, yeah, yeah, so he, he talked about the transport uh, cooperatives and how uh, you have formed the platforms through uh, cooperatives. And what I was wondering is, uh, for example, in my country, we have Uber services, Bolt services, and not those which are owned by other capitalists. Now, when you come to form, to promote the cooperatives, the platform cooperatives, do you use the ones that already exist or do you promote new ones so that uh, let alone those which exist can see the difference and come and join? I would just like to know exactly how you went about it. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um in the case of New York, as you know, for taxis, every situation is different. Because in New York City in 2017, there was a law passed that basically decentralized uh, a driver's ability to drive for any of the platforms. And that was very important. It was a victory for um, a driver. So you could work for Lyft, you could work for Uber. So this was an advantage to us. So you found that drivers, when we formed the cooperative, they will tell us, look, I will do Tuesday and Wednesday for um, the co-op, but I will make my money elsewhere. But right now, we have a number of drivers that just drive for the co-op. Not because, well, partly because they are committed to the, to the very idea of, of ownership 
of the platform, but also because they make good money. We have people that make up to $2,000 a week. I mean, of course, the extreme drivers who, who drive a lot, but most people can make over $200 a day. And so that is working very positively. Thank you. My name is Kring Sak I'm from Just Economy and Labor Institute, a nonprofit in Thailand. I think yeah, we should celebrate some more, some more steps, more changes, like you know, getting better paid, uh, having decent work. But I would like to ask a bigger question and challenge our speakers. What, what do you think? How do we go from here to having a political, political movement that change the system? We want a better change. We want, you know, maybe not a capitalist version of, of the business model. What, what do you think? How do we go from here? Is it possible to have a political movement, the cooperatives, and you know maybe labor who join in climate uh, activists and you know women's and everyone? That's my big question. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is this is such an important question. Thank you. Um, I think what we don't have is <laughs> we're not quite savvy enough yet, maybe, but to have like a very very clear political brief and message. Uh, which, Trevor, I'm kind of looking to you for this, uh, which we can then just roll off whenever we, um, but first I will go to you, uh, whenever we come into contact with anyone in, in a position of political power. Now, as working as equal care, we're kind of punching above our weight, so I'm, I'm starting to talk to particularly, well, ministers, but mostly shadow ministers and the, fingers crossed, incoming Labour government next year, um, to be to start thinking about how cooperatives as a whole but particularly as a platform cooperative looking to scale um, can be embedded into the economy and be supported so they are actively looking at tax breaks and and like a like a, a whole raft of policy changes that could then support the development of co-ops including a big investment scheme all, all sorts of things so yeah so, so maybe i know we're out of time but i guess one sentence i will squeeze in here to address the revolution. Um, so, I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? So, but what you see is uh, uh, like dysfunctional uh, federal government in so many countries, right? I certainly live in one with an entirely dysfunctional federal government. Um, and so the question is, right, where federal labor law in the United States, for example, hasn't done for workers anything that has arrived positively in their life for the last 50 years, right? So uh, cities have, right? Municipalities have done some, have taken some inroads. Um, you, you know, labor unions, uh, traditional uh, uh, unions have uh, largely missed the train on the gig economy. The sort of larger transformative uh, potential, I think, is. is is uh, definitely there when, when, when we align ourselves with other social movements, right, with unions, as we do with the SEIU and with, you know, many other movements. Look at the partners also of this event, right? So, I mean, the, the attempt is, is definitely there. And I think the vision is probably one of a, a digital cooperative commonwealth, right, where you have uh, these sort of, um, you know, uh, supply chains, uh, also being cooperatives uh, north and south, right? Uh, how to get there, I think this is what people aspired to since the 1880s, right? Uh, so I don't have like a ready answer to you, but I think there are these sort of small um, responses.